Hi everyone, we're going to be carrying on with the energy changes topic today that we started yesterday. What we're going to be looking at today is endothermic and exothermic reactions, what they are, what happens during each type, looking at the particles uh, within and some examples of each. So grab yourself a paper, grab yourself some pens and follow along with me. The first term is exothermic. Our second term is endothermic. Okay, as always, we're going to break these words down and look at their look at their different parts and see if we can work out a definition. So the first one, thermic in both. Thermic reminds me of thermal. Thermal makes me think of heat. So thermic in both of them is to do with heat or energy. And if we look at the two words, they both have different prefixes, the first parts of the word. In exothermic we have X-O and in endothermic we have endo. How I remember the two, exothermic, exo makes me think of exit or something being released or leaving. And in endothermic, endo makes you think of enter, so this is energy being given in or being absorbed. So, now we know what the different parts of these terms mean, we can put them together. So exothermic is any reaction that gives out heat, gives out energy during the chemical reaction itself. And using that same logic, endo, entering heat, so that's a chemical reaction where energy, heat, enters, or so some substance will get hotter. Okay, so now they're defined, we're going to go on to some examples of them and how they work. Let's look at exothermic reactions first. So remembering that exo means giving out and thermic, we relate that to heat or energy. In exothermic reactions, the reactants have greater energy than the products. And I'm sure you're all just shouting at the screen, Miss Reese, Miss Reese, why? Why is the reactants have more energy than the products? Well, I'll tell you. The reactants, because it's exo, they're giving out, the reactants are releasing that energy. So that energy is being lost and it's not gonna be passed on to the products. A good way to visualize this is in forms of everyone's favorite thing, a graph. So if you just draw yourself a little graph, we're gonna have energy here. Though, if you're doing this at home, if you had, had experimental tools, or if we're doing this class, we'd measure the energy by looking at the temperature. And then down here, you'd have the progress of the reaction. So how long the reaction is taking. If we were to sort of imagine doing this experiment ourselves, at the beginning, we'd expect the energy of the reactants to be quite high, somewhere up here. Then the products are gonna go, end up with less energy, so we can say they're somewhere down here. So between the temperature we started at and the temperature we end with, it's gonna go down because that energy is being released. Now a real graph would not look like a you know, flat line, straight flat line. It would actually look a bit like this. The reason why you get this bump at the start is that's something called activation energy. At this tender age and this point in your scientific lives, you don't have to know exactly what activation energy is, but long and short of it, it's the energy needed for the chemical reaction to start. So even though the reactants take in a bit of energy to start with, that energy is what's needed to break those bonds, so break up the carbon and the oxygen out of carbon dioxide to form new products. But after you have that initial push to get that reaction going, the energy is going to go down because that energy is being released to break those bonds. So the products end up with a much lower energy. So if you look at that in diagram form, we've got a reactant over here. Doesn't matter what it is, we'll just say this is A and B. They're joined by a chemical bond. 
we have our reaction and then we have our products what's happened here is in order to separate these two atoms to form our product or you could be separating these two atoms to rearrange them into something completely new you need energy so when these bonds are broken when you break bonds that releases some energy so the energy goes from being stored inside the nuclear store in the uh, in the atom and it is transferred as heat So therefore, if all that energy is being released into the surroundings, then the products are going to have a lower energy. Often they'll feel colder. You can actually model a little exothermic reaction here uh, using my amazing technology, but you just got to bear with me a second while I go and get my equipment. Okay, let's model some exothermic reactions then. I'm going to introduce you to Henry the Horrified Hedgehog. I don't know if you can see here, but one of his eyes is slightly wobbly, but that just makes him even more endearing. A good example of an exothermic reaction is combustion. So you've got fuel here, our hydrocarbon in the form of the wax, and energy is going to be released in the form of light and heat this time. So we've got a chemical store of energy in the wax, and the heat is being transferred by heating into the environment. So the light and the heat that I'm feeling are both transfers of energy. So I will leave Henry the Horrified Hedgehog burning away over here while I talk through how this reaction works. So if we take the candle wax, which is a... Remember that's a substance that's made up of hydrogen, hydro and carbon atoms only. You take your candle wax, you add oxygen, so that's oxygen in the air around the candle. You add heat energy. What will happen then is the wax will combust, and the energy that you know energy that's released from breaking up those hydrogens and carbons is what you see and what you feel as light and heat. So you end up with some carbon dioxide and some water and the products so the water vapor and the carbon dioxide gas that gets released has lower energy so the energy has decreased and that is exothermic reactions another good exothermic reaction that you can do at home involves uh, using distilled vinegar or acetic acid as we like to call it in the scientific community, some baking powder or as we like to call it sodium bicarbonate. You'll need a thermometer, I recommend using one that's used for measuring food temperatures because the human thermometers can't go low enough, and a spoon and a cup to do it in. So what we're going to do first is we're going to put a generous glug of vinegar in. Don't mind the fizzing, it's because I trialled this beforehand. Blue Peter star. So we've got our vinegar in there. What we're going to do is take the temperature. That's around 19.9 degrees. What we're going to do then is we're going to add some baking powder. This is a base this is an acid so that will neutralize and hopefully prove that neutralization reactions are an example of an exothermic reaction okay it's pretty much stopped fizzing now so we've got our temperature at the end let's have a look we've got it at 18.3 degrees so it's not gone down much, but it has indeed gone down. So this proves that neutralization is an exothermic reaction. Okay, so let's look what actually happened. We had our acetic acid, or your good old white vinegar. We added some sodium bicarbonate, or baking powder. And that reacted to form 
two, sorry, three new products. You get something called sodium acetate. You also make carbon dioxide. That's what the fizzing is. And you make a little bit of water as well. So the reason this is exothermic is because in order to break the bonds in this, you need a lot more energy than is needed to form these products at the end. Right, let's have a look at endothermic reactions now. So remember, endo means enter, bring in, it's absorbing, and thermic is to do with energy. So in an endothermic reaction, the reactants have less energy than the products. What this means in terms of what's happening with the particles is again, we'll draw ourselves another little graph. We've got our energy here and we've got our progress of our reaction. We often do this in temp as a temperature. So this time what you would have is rather than starting high and ending up low, you would start with a lower energy here with our reactants that goes up into a higher energy in the products overall. If we were to sort of map this as a gradient, we'd start with something about here, the energy would go up, 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 and then it would come down again. Remember, we've still got our activation energy, so that's why it's going to overshoot and then come down. But overall, the amount of energy inside the reaction has gone up. Now I hear you saying again, Miss Reese, why? Why is the energy going up? Well, I'll tell you again. What's happening is we've, again, got our reactants. Doesn't matter what they are at this stage. And we're forming some products. I'll tell you what, we'll make it a bit more complicated. We'll throw in a third type of particle into the mix. Okay, this time we've got our reactants and our products. Rather than in an exothermic reaction, the energy is needed to break those bonds and the energy gets released. What's happening is you need, these reactions need more energy to form the products. So bring, they need more energy to form new bonds than they do to break the original ones. Right, that's us done for today. Have a go at the questions at the end of the quiz and have a go at them on a Google Classroom form as well. And I will see you next time. Extracurricular work today is to draw or make a picture to do something creative when you're done with your schoolwork. And I'll see you soon.